Welcome to CraftLit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 479, Imaginary Scope. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. I am covered in paint. I, <laughs> I have been patching and painting and painting and patching and finding colors paint with. We're still renting, but as long as I use light colors that can easily be taken back to the neutral circa 1974 beige color that most of the place is painted in, I think I'll be fine. Of course, I think I'm improving it considerably. Even the boys, (sighs) you know, you just don't expect your 17-year-old son to say, wow, I thought that was going to be a huge waste of time, but oh my... The bathroom looks so much better now. I figure if that's his response, then I've done something right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm spending most of my time covered in paint. But I have finally finished cleaning out, patching, repairing, making pretty the old place we were in. We're now fully in the new place, although I still don't really have my recording setup done. But Thing 2 and I have plans. So we're going to be working on that starting probably next weekend. He's doing Odyssey of the Mind, so it takes him a little bit of time to recover. It's not this weekend, it's next weekend. So after that, he and I will start actual construction. And it's, of course, portable construction, because if we move again, we will want to take it with us. It's that cool. And I will absolutely have pictures for you as we go. It might just be a kind of a rolling list of of pictures coming onto the Instagram feed of, oh my goodness, here's before, and then more before, and then more before, and some during, and then after. But one of the things that is crafty that I wanted to share with all of you, even if you are not a crafty person, is I found a place to donate a lot of craft supplies that I just wasn't using anymore and I didn't have room for in this place. I found a place to donate them to called The Art of Recycle. The Art of Recycle is located in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. It's near Lancaster. And they are trying to expand beyond their current operation. The whole thing, you can read their whole story on their website, which is artofrecycle.org. And it's a pretty long story, but the upshot is they have created a space with all sorts of recycled objets that can then be made into objet d'art by anyone. Anyone can come in for free and use stuff and make stuff and then take the stuff they made. And they have workshops, which allow people who are curious but don't really know how to do that whole craft thing. It gives them an opportunity to learn a few tips and tricks. And they do allow children, but they have to be of crafting age. They can't be like an infant. It is such a cool idea and such a cool space. And it's all volunteer. It's a 501c3. So if you have items that are, you know, of of good quality that could be used for crafting, contact him. See if you can send them in. Find out if you can start an art of recycle where you live. The whole thing just tickled my fancy so much. I was thrilled and had a garage full of latent art supplies, but also some old clothes and things like that. And I I had the guy come out because there was so much there and just said, go through everything. I'm going to go inside. I'm going to be painting. You go through everything. Take what works for you. And he did. He went through and took like a truckload of items. I was so happy. It just, it seemed like the right thing to do instead of giving it to a thrift store or something like that. Give the stuff to people who are going to actually use it for the purpose that I had originally intended it for. And then make art with it. 
and help other people make art with it. People who wouldn't necessarily be able to do it otherwise. I am absolutely planning on driving out. It's about an hour, hour and a half from here. But I'm going to drive out with the kids later this year and go and frolic with them in the crafting zone. They have a craft castle, which is just, uh, it's like a craft lit person's dream, I think, for the most part, for those of us that are, that are crafty. So check it out. Think about donating. Think about starting one. And that is it for the Crafty Chat today, because we have two chapters. And before we get to those two chapters, I wanted to play for you two phone messages that I received this week that certainly mirror my own feelings about listening to the first two chapters. Here is Tara and Ken. A fan love letter to Kim Zuckert, delivered by way of Heather Ordover and Craftlet. Dear Kim, oh my goodness, can you please read more books? Your delivery of Anne of Green Gables is fantastic. I have not realized what I have been missing knee-deep in grasshoppers on the prairie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I cannot wait to hear more of your enthusiastic interpretation and delivery of Anne of Green Gables. Sincerely, laughing her considerable rump off, Tara Worcester. Hi, this is Ken from Honolulu. Thank you so much to that reader who's doing that first section of Anne. She is just absolutely wonderful. She doesn't whisper, and her cadence is perfect. Oh, that's just great. And also, when she does, when Anne goes into her stream of consciousness chatter, that woman just has it perfectly down. My granddaughter, when she was that age, she used to do that. She'd go into this stream of consciousness talking and wouldn't stop until she was sound asleep or whatever. And it just sounds so perfect. Thank you very, very much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the book. I couldn't agree more. Kim is, she's just a spectacular reader and she's got such a great, like Ken said, a great rhythm to her characterization of all the characters. Ah, it's just so much fun. And of course, not a surprise because she's a craftlet listener. Long time. In fact, I just sent her pictures of the kids now because when she started listening, they were six, almost six and two. Two and a half. So they're a little bigger now. And they're both taller than I am. And I'm sitting down is what that comes down to. <laughs> but yes, oh my goodness. Thank you, Kim, for reading the book for us. Spectacular. Now, I also had asked people to weigh in on their uh, relationship with Anne of Green Cable's books, book or books, because the whole series, from when they were children. And I've got a couple phone calls about that too, ending with a comment on the TV shows. Here we go. My name's Joanne. I'm one of your Canadian listeners. I am a longtime listener and infrequent emailer and commenter and first time caller. So, as I mentioned, I am Canadian. I had very indulgent parents. So, I had the three book box set of Anne of Green Gables, Anne of Avonlea, and Anne of the Island. And then when those fell apart, I had an eight-book box set that was all of the Anne books that were existing at the time. Um, I had all of the Emily of New Moon books, which are fantastic as well. I had basically so many Ellen Montgomery books in my collection, and I loved them, and I loved the Anne books. They meant a lot to me. I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. I took a love of English and of stories and of creativity from all of that. And it was just a very meaningful set of books to me when I was a lot younger. So I just wanted to share that and I hope that I hope that I enjoy listening to the book with all of you. I'm a little concerned. Some of her books have some problematic elements. Kill Many of the Orchard is a little bit difficult to read now, given where we are and 
I I'm just a little worried about hurting one of my childhood favorite stories, but I will listen. I'm going to get through this. About the TV show, for me, it's the 1985 series, perhaps because I was a child at the time, and I did watch it, and I absolutely loved the actors and actresses that they cast, and I loved the story. So for me, it was the 1985 series all the way. The new one is good, but I much prefer the old one. I have a feeling if we took the poll, if we took a poll, uh, 1985 would probably win. Good to hear, though, that you think that the the new one is good, but just not as good. That's kind of the vibe I've been getting. So today's chapters, chapter three and chapter four, I have a few things for you to listen for more than giving you background context. Listen for the use of the word fearsomely and listen for all of the descriptions of Marilla. I think it becomes so important that while Lucy Maud Montgomery was clearly able to kind of channel her inner child and in fact quotes her own childhood journals several times during the course of these two chapters, she's an adult when she's writing the book and her understanding of Marilla is different from Anne's understanding of Marilla. So that's something to pay attention to. Also, listen for the description of a pin cushion, because I, I think I barked. I laughed so loud. Thank God I was in the car at the time and alone. Spare rooms. Spare rooms weren't just a place to store things. Spare rooms were, back in this time period, used as a place where if someone were sick, like dying sick, you would put them in the spare room because it was bigger and more family and friends could come and visit and stay and sit with them. So it was something that was, there was a bed there, nine times out of 10, but it was also not really used for any kind of everyday events. So you'll hear a discussion in Marilla's head about the spare room. A gable room is going to be one of those rooms that has the sloping window in it and sometimes dormered windows. These are windows that instead of being put into basically the roof at an angle, they are constructed in such a way that they've cut a hole in the roof and then they build out like like you were building out part of the regular floor and having to build a new little roof on top of that section and then you'd have the window so you could actually stand up at the window and the glass would be vertical and not leak very important so a gable room is as a room that has at least part of the ceiling is going to be angled because it goes up to the peak in the roof rag rugs Rag rugs were usually braided rags. They were strips of cloth, kind of like using it for uh, using old leftover cloth for the penny quilts. The same idea here, you wanted to use up old fabric. You don't want anything to go to waste. So these were usually very colorful, uh, depending on how wide you cut your strips of fabric to braid. It could be very thick. It could be kind of scrawny. But Anne makes a comment about not having seen a rag rug before. And at first I thought, hmm, I wonder why. And then I thought, oh, because number one, she made it clear that the orphanage received a bunch of fabric that was really not very attractive fabric. But also the chances are they were using the fabric for everything and making a rug would not be high on that priority list. At the beginning of chapter four today, you will hear a description of Green Gables, a very, very Anne-oriented, detailed description of what she sees out of the window. This is a description of one of the places Lucy Maud Montgomery lived. And Avonlea isn't a real place. Cavendish is where Lucy Maud Montgomery lived. So I have put a little Google map on the show notes for this episode. So craftlit.com slash 479. If you go and you look at it, you can do the little... Google map trick where you drag the little cartoon guy onto the road and then you can see everything from the road's point of view. You can also see on the map that there's Anne of Green Gables historical stuff all over the place. Just cementing what I had said a couple weeks ago about Lucy Maud Montgomery really getting the short end of the fame thing because everything was Anne and nothing was Lucy Maud Montgomery. By the way, she went by Maud. M-A-U-D, and she was not pleased when people put an E 
at the end of Maud. Uh, she didn't like Lucy at all, but I thought that was kind of funny. You will hear two references to making a bed. The first is get out of bed, get dressed, get ready to go downstairs for breakfast. Take the bed clothes, the things that you were sleeping underneath, and pull them back down towards the foot of the bed. So you are basically leaving the entire bed exposed. This was really important because you're also going to hear, leave the window open. This was your chance to air out the bed. Super, super important, especially if you had a feather bed, because those things could start to smell. So if you were hot and sweaty during the night or whatever, you want to air the bed out. It's also a way to avoid getting dust mites and, or at least getting as many dust mites and all of those kind of creepy crawly things trapped in your bed. So that's the first thing. The second is wrestling the tick. This is not a tick like an animal. This is like mattress ticking. Mattress ticking is that really thick cotton, sometimes linen, fabric that was used to make a mattress. Often it was blue and white striped. It wasn't always, but often it was. The idea was you needed something very thick and very tightly woven to keep the feathers in. Now, a feather bed might use 50 pounds of feathers. <laughs> and about four times a year, you could harvest the down feathers, the downy feathers from the breast of, of geese, probably not so much chickens, but uh, any larger birds. It's kind of like the kiviet, you know, taking the, the down from a muskox. <laughs> not that you want to walk up to the muskox and say, hey, dude, <laughs> let me reach up under your fur. In, in that case, you harvest it off of fence posts and places that they rub up against. With geese, it's a little different. <laughs> and it didn't have to be at a time when you were going to chow down on the goose with the, the downy feathers. With the regular feathers, you're going to pluck the bird to eat it. You save those. There's a whole mess load of history about how feather beds were made. And I've actually linked out to a page on it if you are interested. It's, it's kind of cool. But you are going to wind up with not a mattress that looks like what we have now. It'd be a little bit more like a, a futon and not a really compact futon, but more like one of the futons that you could roll up like a bedroll. Uh, you were going to be lucky if it was several inches thick. And as you might imagine, if you are sleeping on a pile of feathers wrapped inside a pile of cotton fabric, it might be kind of lumpy when you get out of bed. And you don't want it to stay lumpy because that would mean that as the bed is finishing airing out, it would kind of stay in that position. And then when you get into bed that night, that won't be fun. And these, these mattress ticks were often put onto a, a woven rope foundation. So the bed would be a frame and the frame would weave rope, like hemp rope, back and forth so that the mattress would be supported by that, that woven like a hammock, kind of big hammock. So making a bed was a different journey <laughs> back then. Uh, and an extinguisher. Extinguisher is not a fire extinguisher like we have now. An extinguisher to them would be that little metal cap that you would put over a candle to snuff the candle out. And I've got some pictures for that as well on the Craftlet show notes, craftlet.com 479. And if you have any comments to share, anything I missed that you think would be interesting to listeners, Call 1-206-350-1642 or go to speakpipe.com slash craftlit. All right, let's listen to chapters three and four read for us by Kim, who is awesome. Here we go. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 3. Marilla Cuthbert is Surprised Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door, but when her eye fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stopped short in amazement. "'Matthew Cuthbert, who's that?' she ejaculated. "'Where's the boy?' "'There wasn't any boy,' said Matthew wretchedly. "'There was only her.' He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her name. No boy, but there must have been a boy, 
insisted Marilla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She brought her. I asked the station master, and I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, this is a pretty piece of business, ejaculated Marilla. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. "'You don't want me!' she cried. "'You don't want me because I'm not a boy! I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to left. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears!' burst into tears she did, sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it, and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other deprecatingly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to say or do. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there's no need to cry so about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. "'You would cry, too, if you were an orphan and had come to a place you thought was going to be home and found that they didn't want you because you weren't a boy? This is the most tragical thing that ever happened to me!' Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Well, don't cry any more. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia? She said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name, but I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. But oh, please call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to you what you call me if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it explained Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least I always have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine, but I like Cordelia better now. If you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? asked Marilla with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. When you hear a name pronounced, can't you always see it in your mind just as if it was printed out? I can, and A-N-N looks dreadful, but A-N-N-E looks so much more distinguished. If you'll only call me Anne spelled with an E, I shall try to reconcile myself to not being called Cordelia. Very well then, Anne spelled with an E. Can you tell us how this mistake came to be made? We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring us a boy. Were there no boys at the asylum? Oh, yes, there was an abundance of them. But Mrs. Spencer said distinctly that you wanted a girl about 11 years old, and the matron said she thought I would do. You don't know how delighted I was. I couldn't sleep all last night for joy. Oh, she added reproachfully, turning to Matthew, why didn't you tell me at the station that you didn't want me and leave me there? If I hadn't seen the white way of delight in the lake of shining waters, it wouldn't be so hard. "'What on earth does she mean?' demanded Marilla, staring at Matthew. "'She's she's just referring to some conversation we had on the road,' said Matthew hastily. "'I'm going out to put the mare in, Marilla. Have tea ready when I come back.' "'Did Mrs. Spencer bring anybody over besides you?' continued Marilla when Matthew had gone out. "'She brought Lily Jones for herself. Lily is only five years old and she's very beautiful and had nut-brown hair. "'If I was very beautiful and had nut-brown hair, would you keep me?' "'No, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl would be no use to us. "'Take off your hat and I'll lay it in your bag on the hall table.' "'Anne took off her hat meekly. Matthew came back presently and they sat down to supper. "'But Anne could not eat. In vain she nibbled at the bread and butter and pecked at the crab-apple preserve out of the little scalloped glass dish by her plate. She did not really make any headway at all. 
"'You're not eating anything,' said Marilla sharply, eyeing her as if it were a serious shortcoming. Anne sighed. "'I can't. I'm in the depths of despair. Can you eat when you're in the depths of despair?' "'I've never been in the depths of despair, so I can't say,' responded Marilla. "'Weren't you? Well, did you ever try to imagine you were in the depths of despair?' "'No, I didn't.' "'Then I don't think you can understand what it's like. "'It's a very uncomfortable feeling, indeed. "'When you try to eat, a lump comes right in your throat "'and you can't swallow anything, not even if it was a chocolate caramel. "'I had one chocolate caramel once two years ago, and it was simply delicious.' I've often dreamt since then that I had a lot of chocolate caramels, but I always wake up just when I'm going to eat them. I do hope you won't be offended because I can't eat. Everything is extremely nice, but still I cannot eat. I guess she's tired, said Matthew, who hadn't spoken since his return from the barn. Best put her to bed, Marilla. Marilla had been wondering where Anne should be put to bed. She had prepared a couch in the kitchen chamber for the desired and expected boy, but... Although it was neat and clean, it did not seem quite the thing to put a girl there somehow. But the spare room was out of the question for such a stray waif, so there remained only the East Gable room. Marilla lighted a candle and told Anne to follow her, which Anne spiritlessly did, taking her hat and carpet bag from the hall table as she passed. The hall was fearsomely clean. The little gable chamber in which she presently found herself seemed still cleaner. Marilla set the candle on a three-legged, three-cornered table and turned down the bedclothes. "'I suppose you have a nightgown?' she questioned. Anne nodded. "'Yes, I have two. The matron of the asylum made them for me. They're fearfully skimpy. There's never enough to go around in an asylum, so things are always skimpy, at least in a poor asylum like ours. I hate skimpy nightdresses, but one can dream just as well in them as in lovely trailing ones with frills around the neck. That's one consolation.' "'Well, undress as quick as you can and go to bed. "'I'll come back in a few minutes for the candle. "'I daren't trust you to put it out yourself. "'You'd likely set the place on fire.' "'When Marilla had gone, Anne looked around her wistfully. "'The whitewashed walls were so painfully bare and staring "'that she thought they must ache over their own bareness. "'The floor was bare, too, except for a round braided mat in the middle, "'such as Anne had never seen before. "'In one corner was the bed, a high, old-fashioned one, with four dark, low-turned posts. In the other corner was the aforesaid three-corner table, adorned with a fat red velvet pincushion hard enough to turn the point of the most adventurous pin. Above it hung a little six-by-eight mirror. Midway between table and bed was the window, with an icy white muslin frill over it, and opposite it was the washstand. The whole apartment was of a rigidity not to be described in words, but which sent a shiver to the very marrow of Anne's bones. With a sob, she hastily discarded her garments, put on the skimpy nightgown, and sprang into bed where she burrowed face downward into the pillow and pulled the clothes over her head. When Marilla came up for the light, various skimpy articles of raiment scattered most untidily over the floor, and a certain tempestuous appearance of the bed were the only indications of any presence save her own. She deliberately picked up Anne's clothes, placed them neatly on a prim yellow chair, and then, taking up the candle, went over to the bed. "'Good night,' she said, a little awkwardly, but not unkindly. Anne's white face and big eyes appeared over the bedclothes with a startling suddenness. "'How can you call it a good night when you know it must be the very worst night I've ever had?' she said reproachfully. Then she dived down into invisibility again. Marilla went slowly down to the kitchen and proceeded to wash the supper dishes. Matthew was smoking, a sure sign of perturbation of mind. He seldom smoked, for Marilla set her face against it as a filthy habit, but at certain times and seasons he felt driven to it, and then Marilla winked at the practice, realizing that a mere man must have some vent for his emotions. "'Well, this is a pretty kettle of fish,' she said wrathfully. "'This is what comes of sending word instead of going ourselves. "'Richard Spencer's folks have twisted that message somehow. "'One of us will have to drive over and see Mrs. Spencer tomorrow, that's certain. "'This girl will have to be sent back to the asylum.' "'Yes, I suppose so,' said Matthew reluctantly. "'You suppose so? Don't you know it?' "'Well, now she's a real nice little thing, Marilla.' It's kind of a pity to send her back when she's so set on staying here. Matthew Cuthbert, you don't mean to say you think we ought to keep her? 
Merla's astonishment could not have been greater if Matthew had expressed a predilection for standing on his head. "'Well, now, no, I suppose not, not exactly,' stammered Matthew, uncomfortably driven into a corner for his precise meaning. "'I suppose we could hardly be expected to keep her.' "'I should say not. What good would she be to us?' "'We might be some good to her,' said Matthew suddenly and unexpectedly. "'Matthew Cuthbert, I believe that child has bewitched you. I can see as plain as plain that you want to keep her.' "'Well, now, she's a real interesting little thing,' persisted Matthew. "'You should have heard her talk coming from the station.' "'Oh, she can talk fast enough. I saw that at once. "'It's nothing in her favor, either. "'I don't like children who have so much to say. "'I don't want an orphan girl, and if I did, she isn't the style I'd pick out. "'There's something I don't understand about her. "'No, she's got to be dispatched straight away back where she came from.' "'I could hire a French boy to help me,' said Matthew, "'and she'd be company for you.' "'I'm not suffering for company,' said Marilla shortly, "'and I'm not going to keep her.' "'Well, now, it's just as you say, of course, Marilla,' "'said Matthew, rising and putting his pipe away. "'I'm going to bed.' "'To bed went Matthew, "'and to bed, when she had put her dishes away, went Marilla, "'frowning most resolutely. "'And upstairs, in the east gable, "'a lonely, heart-hungry, friendless child "'cried herself to sleep. End of chapter 3 Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery Read by Kim Zuckert Chapter 4 Morning at Green Gables It was broad daylight when Anne awoke and sat up in bed, staring confusedly at the window through which a flood of cheery sunshine was pouring, and outside of which something white and feathery waved across glimpses of blue sky. For a moment she could not remember where she was. First came a delightful thrill, as something very pleasant, then a horrible remembrance. This was Green Gables, and they didn't want her because she wasn't a boy. But it was morning, and yes, it was a cherry tree in full bloom outside of her window. With a bound she was out of bed and across the floor. She pushed up the sash. It went up stiffly and creakily, as if it hadn't been opened for a long time, which was the case and it stuck so tight that nothing was needed to hold it up. Anne dropped on her knees and gazed out into the June morning, her eyes glistening with delight. Oh, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it a lovely place? Suppose she wasn't really going to stay here. She would imagine she was. There was scope for the imagination here. A huge cherry tree grew outside, so close that its boughs tapped against the house, and it was so thick set with blossoms that hardly a leaf was to be seen. On both sides of the house was a big orchard, one of apple trees and one of cherry trees, also showered over with blossoms, and their grass was all sprinkled with dandelions. In the garden below were lilac trees purple with flowers, and their dizzily sweet fragrance drifted up to the window on the morning wind. Below the garden, a green field lush with clover sloped down to the hollow where the brook ran, and where scores of white birches grew, upspringing airily out of an undergrowth suggested of delightful possibilities in ferns and mosses and woodsy things generally. Beyond it was a hill, green and feathery with spruce and fir. There was a gap in it, where the grey gable end of the little house she had seen from the other end of the Lake of Shining Waters was visible. Off to the left were the big barns, and beyond them, away down over green, low-sloping fields, was a sparkling blue glimpse of sea. Anne's beauty-loving eyes lingered on it all, taking everything greedily in. She had looked on so many unlovely places in her life, poor girl, but this was as lovely as anything she had ever dreamed. She knelt there, lost to everything but the loveliness around her, until she was startled by a hand on her shoulder. Marilla had come in unheard by the small dreamer. "'It's time you were dressed,' she said curtly. Marilla really did not know how to talk to the child, and her uncomfortable ignorance made her crisp and curt when she did not mean to be. Anne stood up and drew a long breath. "'Oh, isn't it wonderful?' she said, waving her hand comprehensively at the good world outside." "'It's a big tree,' said Marilla, "'and it blooms great, but the fruit don't amount to much never, small and wormy.' "'Oh, I don't mean the tree. Of course, it's lovely. Yes, it's radiantly lovely. It blooms as if it meant it. 
but I meant everything, the garden and the orchard and the brook and the woods, the whole big dear world. Don't you feel as if you just loved the world on a morning like this? And I can hear the brook laughing all the way up here. Have you ever noticed what cheerful things brooks are? They're always laughing. Even in winter time, I've heard them under the ice. I'm so glad there's a brook near Green Gables. Perhaps you don't think it doesn't make any difference to me when you're not going to keep me, but it does. I shall always like to remember that there's a brook at Green Gables, even if I never see it again. If there wasn't a brook, I'd be haunted by the uncomfortable feeling that there ought to be one. I'm not in the depths of despair this morning. I never can be in the morning. Isn't it a splendid thing that there are mornings? But I feel very sad. I've just been imagining that it was really me you wanted after all, and that I was to stay here forever and ever. Ah, oh, it was a great comfort while it lasted. But the worst of imagining things is that the time come when you have to stop, and that hurts. You better get dressed and come downstairs, never mind your imaginings, said Marilla, as soon as she could get a word in edgewise. Breakfast is waiting. Wash your face and comb your hair. Leave the window up and turn your bedclothes back over the foot of the bed. Be as smart as you can. Anne could evidently be smart to some purpose, for she was downstairs in ten minutes' time with her clothes neatly on, her hair brushed and braided, her face washed, and a comfortable consciousness pervading her soul that she had fulfilled all Marilla's requirements. As a matter of fact, however, she had forgotten to turn back the bedclothes. "'I'm pretty hungry this morning,' she announced, as she slipped into the chair Marilla placed for her. "'The world doesn't seem such a howling wilderness as it did last night. "'I'm so glad it's a sunshiny morning. "'But I like rainy mornings real well, too. "'All sorts of mornings are interesting, don't you think? "'You don't know what's going to happen through the day, "'and there's so much scope for imagination. "'But I'm glad it's not rainy today because it's easier to be cheerful "'and bear up under affliction on a sunshiny day. "'I feel that I have a good deal to bear up under.' It's all very well to read about sorrows and imagine yourself living through them heroically, but it's not so nice when you really come to have them, is it? For pity's sake, hold your tongue, said Marilla. You talk entirely too much for a little girl. Thereupon Anne held her tongue so obediently and thoroughly that her continued silence made Marilla rather nervous, as if in the presence of something not exactly natural. Matthew also held his tongue, but this was natural, so that the meal was a very silent one. As it progressed, Anne became more and more abstracted, eating mechanically, with her big eyes fixed unswervingly and unseeingly on the sky outside the window. This made Marilla more nervous than ever. She had an uncomfortable feeling that while this odd child's body may be there at the table, her spirit was far away in some remote, airy cloudland, borne aloft on the wings of imagination. Who would want such a child about the place? Yet Matthew wished to keep her of all unaccountable things. Marilla felt that he wanted it just as much this morning as he had the night before, and that he would go on wanting it. That was Matthew's way, take a whim into his head and cling to it with the most amazing, silent persistency, a persistency ten times more potent and effectual in its very silence than if he'd talked it out. When the meal was ended, Anne came out of her reverie and offered to wash the dishes. "'Can you wash dishes right?' asked Marilla, distrustfully. "'Pretty well. I'm better at looking after children, though. I've had so much experience at that. It's such a pity you haven't any here for me to look after.' "'I don't feel as if I wanted any more children to look after than I've got at present. Your problem enough in all conscience. What's to be done with you, I don't know. Matthew is a most ridiculous man.' "'I think he's lovely,' said Anne reproachfully. "'He's so very sympathetic. He didn't mind how much I talked. He seemed to like it. I felt that he was a kindred spirit as soon as ever I saw him.' "'You're both queer enough, if that's what you mean by kindred spirits,' said Marilla, with a sniff. "'Yes, you may wash the dishes. Take plenty of hot water and be sure you dry them well. I've got enough to attend to this morning, for I'll have to drive over to White Sands in the afternoon and see Mrs. Spencer. You'll come with me, and we'll settle what's to be done with you. After you've finished the dishes, go upstairs and make your bed.' Anne washed the dishes deftly enough, as Marilla, who kept a sharp eye on the process, discerned. Later on, she made her bed less successfully, for she had never learned the art of wrestling with a feather tick. But it was done somehow, and smoothed down, and then Marilla, to get rid of her, told her she might go out of doors and amuse herself until dinner time. Anne flew to the door, face alight, eyes glowing. On the very threshold, she stopped, short, wheeled about, came back, and sat down by the table, light and glow as effectually blotted out as if someone had clapped an extinguisher on her. "'What's the matter now?' demanded Marilla. "'I don't dare go out,' said Anne, in the tone of a martyr relinquishing all earthly joys. "'If I can't stay here, there's no use in my loving Green Gables. 
and if I go out there and get acquainted with all those trees and flowers and the orchard and the brook, I'll not be able to help loving it. It's hard enough now, so I won't make it any harder. I want to go out so much. Everything seems to be calling to me. Anne, Anne, come out to us. Anne, Anne, we want a playmate. But it's better not. There's no use in loving things if you have to be torn from them, is there? And it's so hard to keep from loving things, isn't it? That was why I was so glad when I thought I was going to live here. I thought I'd have so many things to love and nothing to hinder me. But that brief dream is over. I'm resigned to my fate now, so I don't think I'll go out for fear I'll get unresigned again. What is the name of that geranium on the windowsill, please? That's the apple-scented geranium. Oh, I don't mean that sort of a name. I mean just a name you gave it yourself. Didn't you give it a name? May I give it one, then? May I call it... Let me see... Bonnie would do. May I call it Bonnie while I'm here? Oh, do let me. Goodness, I don't care. But where on earth is the sense of naming a geranium? Oh, I like things to have handles, even if they're only geraniums. It makes them seem more like people. How do you know but that it hurts a geranium's feelings just to be called a geranium and nothing else? You wouldn't like to be called nothing but a woman all the time. Yes, I shall call it Bonnie. I named that cherry tree outside my bedroom window this morning. I called it Snow Queen because it was so white. Of course, it won't always be in blossom, but one can imagine that it is, can't one? I never in all my life saw or heard anything to equal her, muttered Marilla, beating a retreat down to the cellar after potatoes. She is kind of interesting, as Matthew says. I can feel already that I'm wondering what on earth she'll say next. She'll be casting a spell over me, too. She's cast it over Matthew. That look he gave me when he went out said everything he said or hinted last night over again. I wish he was like other men and would talk things out. A body could answer back and argue him into reason. But what's to be done with a man who just looks? Anne had relapsed into reverie, with her chin in her hands and her eyes on the sky, when Marilla returned from her cellar pilgrimage. There Marilla left her until the early dinner was on the table. "'I suppose I can have the mare and buggy this afternoon, Matthew,' said Marilla. Matthew nodded and looked wistfully at Anne. Marilla intercepted the look and said grimly, "'I'm going to drive over to White Sands and settle this thing. "'I'll take Anne with me, and Mrs. Spencer will probably make arrangements "'to send her back to Nova Scotia at once. "'I'll set your tea out for you, and I'll be home in time to milk the cows.' "'Still Matthew said nothing, and Marilla had a sense of having wasted words and breath. "'There is nothing more aggravating than a man who won't talk back, "'unless it's a woman who won't.' "'Matthew hitched the sorrel into the buggy in due time.' and Marilla and Anne set off. Matthew opened the yard gate for them, and as they drove slowly through, he said, to nobody in particular as it seemed, "'Little Jerry Beatt from the creek was here this morning, and I told him I guessed I'd hire him for the summer.' Marilla made no reply, but she hit the unlucky sorrel such a vicious clip with the whip that the fat mare, unused to such treatment, whizzed indignantly down the lane at an alarming pace. Marilla looked back once as the buggy bounced along and saw that aggravating Matthew, leaning over the gate, looking wistfully after them. End of chapter four. All right. So we have an adventure afoot. Marilla is going to have to figure out what to do about Anne. Anne, of course, hopes that she doesn't have to leave. And Anne, I thought it was great that she asked to be named Cordelia, or she has to be called Cordelia. Cordelia, if you recall, in King Lear, was the faithful daughter, the faithful one. Regan and Goneril, not so much. But Cordelia also, in Welsh, means jewel of the sea. So that's kind of cool. And I don't know about you, but when, when Anne was talking about really wishing that she had a frilly nightgown, I thought, yeah, you're only saying that because you haven't had to wear one. And ugh, all the, the, anything like lace around your neck at nighttime just makes me go, Rrr. So maybe, maybe for her, it would be exciting, but you. And did you notice the parallel on the setting the place on fire that Miss Rachel in chapter one had said that another family had gotten an orphan who burnt the house down. And so Marilla takes Anne up to her room with a candle and says, I'll be back for it in a minute. You might just burn the house down. And I thought, mm. so she was paying attention. And Anne did something that just made me laugh out loud because it went along with a, a modern YouTuber that I was just 
listening to a video that had been made about this this YouTuber, but it was when Marilla said goodnight, you know, which is just a figure of speech. There it is. And Aunt turns around. How can you say it's a good night when it's the worst night I've ever had? There is a YouTuber named Liza, and she is famous for taking critical comments, YouTube comments, literally. So for example, someone someone wrote and said, I can't believe this stupid witch with a capital B is so famous. And she looks up, she reads that and then looks up at the camera and says, oh my God, he thinks I'm famous. I just love that positivity because there's so little of it out there in the world. I will link to a particularly funny Liza video and I will link to the commentary that was done about why she got so famous so fast. And it is because of her positive attitude. So here Anne is, it's not that Anne is being particularly positive, but it is that she's taking just the regular old good night, very literally. It is not a good night. <laughs> There's nothing good about this night. Ah. I also adored Matthew's comment to Marilla. The, well, I don't know what good she'll be for us, but we might be some good to her. What a wonderful, wonderful man Matthew is. Now, did you catch all of the things about Marilla? <laughs> the pin cushion, so compact. Com you know, it's sand compacted in there. that <laughs> You probably really actually couldn't get a needle into the pin cushion. But did you hear the, the description? She's awkward, but not unkind. Her, her comment to Matthew, I'm not suffering for company. You know, it's, I'm not lonely. And you kind of think, wow, with all the descriptions of you, not not knowing how to say something or not being sure how to talk to a kid, and not only a kid, but a really friendly one, maybe it could do with a little company around the place, just possibly. But I thought a real giveaway to Marilla's character was that when she came to say good morning and get Anne up, she didn't just holler up the stairs and she didn't stand at the doorway and say, okay, get out of bed now. She came up behind Anne while she was looking out the window in this reverie and put her hand on Anne's shoulder. And then the narrative was that she was uncomfortable and her ignorance made her crisp and curt when she didn't mean to be. And I thought that was such a lovely description because I, I feel like that describes, well, certainly me, but I'm assuming other people have that happen to them too. When you're in a situation that is not your your native state. It's not a situation you're in very often. And your level of discomfort can affect what it looks like to the outside world. Often when I have uh, made a mistake or I've put something down, I can't remember where it is, I get really angry at myself. And for years, Andrew thought I was angry at him. And finally, he said something about it, thank God. And I was able to say, what? <laughs> Why would I be mad at you? I'm furious at myself for being stupid again. And it just seems to me to be a really easy way to have your actions misunderstood by the outside world when you are uncomfortable. You're not going to see it the way they see it, and they aren't going to understand what's going on inside of you necessarily. I also love the description of the tree that Anne's talking about how gorgeous it is and it's beautiful. And Marilla's like, yeah, well, the fruit isn't very good. And meh. she's very production for use and, you know, waste not, want not. Everything needs to be for a reason for a purpose. But the statement that Anne made where she talks about the the tree blooming as though it meant it, that was one of the lines from Lucy Maud Montgomery's childhood journals. She was describing a geranium. And later in the chapter, you have the geranium thing. But LMM uh, reorganized those particular clips. And that was really, really cool, I thought. The last thing is, I don't know if you caught it, when Matthew says that he'll hire the little French boy to come and work. He will hire the French boy. He will, he is willing to pay someone to help him so that they can keep Anne. And that's, that's not nothing. That's a, that's a statement. And Marilla is not going to misunderstand that. That's going to have an impact. And that's where we're going to leave it until next week. I hope you enjoyed your chapters today. Thank you again to Kim. Oh, what great reading. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Have a great one. Bye.
A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>